So in the last video, what I was looking at was projectile motion. And effectively, this is the kind of projectile motion that we can look at with what we call direct fire weapons. And I know there are loads of examples, but I thought I'd just use the kind of, you know, projectile motion in terms of weaponry, which I know a lot of people are interested in. But there's many other examples of, you know, balls being thrown, hose pipes and waters and stuff. But I thought I'd use this just for these videos. So in the last video, we looked at sort of direct fire weapons. And that's what you get with things like armoured vehicles, like tanks. Uh, maybe some of the lighter sort of uh, reconnaissance vehicles where they basically use their weapon to fire directly at the enemy. And I think in the last one I used an example of if you have uh, maybe a rifle which is fired, we can look at how um, the bullet sort of starts travelling initially horizontally and then it moves uh, more vertically as the motion goes on. But this video is about something a bit different and this is very much about indirect fire. Now indirect fire is what the artillery are very good at. Artillery guns aren't designed to take the enemy, uh, you know, head on. I mean, they can be used in the direct fire role if, you know, the enemy are getting particularly close and this isn't necessarily where you want to be having to fire directly at the enemy. But basically, artillery is designed to fire at a high angle over a long distance. And it's this indirect fire, the fact that we initially start out with our projectile moving upwards, that I'm going to look at in this video. So this is a light gun and what it does is it fires projectiles that uh, weigh about sort of 35 pounds or I guess have a mass of about sort of 15 to 20 kilograms and it can basically be uh, you know sort of towed behind a vehicle, it can be underslung with a helicopter and it's very versatile and it's been used in a lot of conflicts by the British Army and others you know since the Falkland Islands and you know more recently in Iraq and Afghanistan. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to imagine this field gun here firing a projectile over a certain distance and effectively what it's going to do is uh, when it's fired, we're gonna maybe sort of just, you know, look at an example with, you know, an ideal physics world. Now in this ideal physics world, there is no air resistance and that's really important. So we can use CVAT equations. In real life, what you have to do is if you're working out where these guns fire, and this is one of the jobs that uh, the gun line do, they need to take into account things like the wind and what direction the wind is blowing at at different altitudes. They need to take into account the temperature of the air and also the, the explosives that are being used to you know, propel the, the thing forward or the, the, the propellant really that we use to propel the, the projectile forward. We have to think about things like even like the direction of the rotation of the earth because if you're firing north to south that's gonna, the earth is going to be rotating in a different way as if you're firing east to west. And there's a whole amount of things that have to be taken into account when you're looking at real artillery. But we're going to imagine a nice, simple physics world. And what I'd like to do is imagine that the projectile comes out at perhaps 300 metres per second. Uh, so it's going to travel at about 300 metres per second, uh, so just under the speed of sound. And we're going to imagine that this is at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal. And what we're going to look at is the motion of this projectile, basically in the first half of its flight, and then the second half until it lands again. So what I've done is I've basically drawn that in this kind of lovely kind of parabola, and I've done it in two colours just to be very clear that I've got my first half and the second half of that journey. So now what I'd like to consider is I'd like to consider SUVAT equations. And again, we've got no drag, nothing like that, no air resistance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down SUVAT two times. And what I'd like to consider is SUVAT both horizontally and also SUVAT in the vertical direction, where what I'm going to do is I'm going to take upwards as my positive direction. What I can then do is start to write in what I know. So I don't know how far it's gone horizontally, and again, this is very much the first half of the journey that I'm thinking about here. Do I know the initial velocity u? Well, I do, because if we know that it's uh, at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal, I can use 30 cos, uh, sorry, cos 30 times 300, and therefore my initial velocity is going to be equal to 259.81 metres per second. Okay, I just worked that out, that out earlier. I'm giving it to five significant figures so I don't kind of round down too early. And uh, this is going to be the velocity of the projectile once it leaves the end of the barrel. So not before it starts and kind of gets up to speed in the barrel, but this is from leaving the gun itself. Now, if we know that there's no acceleration in the horizontal direction, it's always going to have the same horizontal velocity there's no acceleration and therefore its final velocity as it kind of hits the target over here is going to be equal to 259.81 meters per second and that's all I know at the moment I don't know how long it's flying for but we can work it out okay in the other direction the vertical direction do we know how high it goes uh, not yet do we know its initial vertical velocity well we can work it out because if it's going at 300 meters at uh, 30 degrees it's 300 sine 30 which is equal to 150 meters per second in the upwards direction. The final velocity up here 
so this is where we're talking about the final velocity for the red section, it's going to be equal to zero because that's the point where it's got to the highest point and isn't going any higher. The acceleration vertically is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared. But because we're looking at upwards as positive and the acceleration is downwards, that is a negative value. So here I have some data and just from this information, I can work out how far it goes, how high it goes and how long it takes to get there. We can say that v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as. If I rearrange this to make s a subject, I can then say that um, s is equal to v squared minus u squared over 2a. And if I put the numbers in, we know that the final velocity is zero. Uh, the initial velocity was uh, in the upwards direction we're talking about now was 150. And we times that, we, we divide that then by 2 times minus 9.81. And if we do the maths, we find that the maximum height it reaches is equal to 1,146.79 metres. So I've given it there to the full amount of, or almost the kind of the, the full display of my calculator. But what we can say then is basically to, to maybe three significant figures, which is what we had our data to over here. The maximum height is 1,150 metres. Does that sound about right? Well, yes, it does. You know, the max vertex, the, the kind of the height that these kind of things go to is pretty high, about 3,000 feet. And this is important because if you have a battlefield with lots of things happening, you know, perhaps you have uh, helicopters, you know, in support, you need to make sure that helicopters aren't flying over the gun line or the, the gun to target line. And that's really important when it comes to sort of deconflicting the airspace. So, um, again, we've got sort of helicopters, we've got other things in the air. That's the height that it gets to. So we can then put it into our table over here. How long does it take to get to that height? Well, what we can then use is the equation that um, v is equal to u plus at. I'm going to rearrange this to make t the subject to say that t is equal to v minus u over a, uh, and that's equal to 0 minus 150 over minus 9.81. And again, if I put that into my calculator, I found that the value is equal to 15.291 of a second. So the time it takes to get up to that height is about 15.3 seconds. Again, is that reasonable? Well, yeah, you know, this thing is going pretty high. You know, if it's going up to 3,000 feet, it's going to take about 15 seconds. So again, now I have my time, uh, which is 15.3. What I will do, though, is make sure that I keep this in my calculator or I'll write down the full value and use that for any subsequent calculations. So if that's the time that it takes to go up, that must also be the time that it takes to go along. Uh, from this point to this point over here. So that's also going to be equal to 15.3. And if I'd like to find out the, the distance from here to here, again, I can use uh, the equation effectively, um, you know, the speed is equal to the displacement divided by the time, or the displacement is equal to the velocity times the time, which is equal to 259.81 times 15.3. And then if I work out the distance, that's equal to 3,900 and 72.6 meters. So the distance is about 3,770 meters, which is just under four kilometers. But the important thing is that is only the distance for the first half of the journey. Now, if that's the distance for the first half and it takes just as much time to go up as it takes to come down, and it goes at the same horizontal velocity throughout because there's no drag, we also know that it goes about 3,770 metres on the second half of the journey over here, which is something that people often forget. So I've basically taken the whole thing and broken it down into two. So what does that mean? Well, overall, then, it means that uh, for this thing here, the range, I'm just going to write up here, the range is about roughly 8,000 metres. So eight kilometres. One of these light guns can fire at a target eight kilometres away and still hit it. In actual fact, the total range is about 17.2 kilometres. So, you know, they can go a long way. How high does it go? Well, it goes up to about sort of 1,150 metres up. So it goes up pretty high. And again, the total time of flight, well, if it takes 15.3 seconds to go that far, the total time of flight is going to be equal to about 31 seconds. And again, that's a reasonable amount of time for a projectile to be in the air. So it might be uh, called over the radio that you have shot 3-1, uh, and then, you know, 31 seconds later, that's when the, uh, the round is going to impact with the target. So I know this is very much a kind of military themed kind of example. The same thing happens if you're looking at balls being thrown in the air, if it's cannonballs, if it's uh, maybe the, the, the way that some water flows. Any example, it behaves in exactly the same way. 
a constant horizontal velocity and the vertical velocity, first of all, it decreases and then it increases again. And what I've done is I split the whole thing into two halves. I've taken the first half and I've looked at SUVAT vertically and horizontally, worked out my data and then used that as I've sort of worked myself around. Okay, my working out is a bit messy, but I do have, hopefully, the right answer. Thank you very much.